Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2015 Marina Bay Neighborhood Council Candidates Night. You're always well attended. I think they're a lot of fun. I hope you do by the time we're finished. Because we have a very tight time frame, our meetings are normally an hour and a half, and we stay fairly close to that. Uh, I have thought many times how we can structure the candidates' night so that we can cover a lot of ground, but not run much past an hour and a half. And the best format that I've been able to come up with is to have a fast and furious presentation, seven minutes for each candidate. Uh, they will address one question. That question is, what is the biggest problem facing Richmond? And there's another part of that question, how do you plan to address it? Now the candidates can use their seven minutes for whatever they want, but it's our guidance that this is really what we're looking for as the Marina Bay Neighborhood Council. Um, the, uh, we have all 15 candidates, which is always very exciting. Um, what I did was, how many of you don't have this sheet? A few of you. We can get them scattered down. Um, what I did, we have two candidates for mayor, and so I flipped the coin on their behalf to decide who's going to go first. If they want to reflip, they can. Um, no, no worry about that. For everybody else, I took the order that they're going to appear on the ballot. And I put that into a random number generator, and that's the order in which they're speaking tonight. So I don't know how to get more objective than that. Uh, and again, it's, it's a seven-minute time frame to speak. Candidate will come up, have the floor, and when their seven minutes is up, and we've got a timekeeper here, we'll let you know uh, when you have five minutes remaining, three minutes remaining, two minutes remaining, and you know, one minute and then your time is up. And uh, for Vinay, we will verbalize that. Uh, are there any questions uh, on your part? All right. So at uh, only four minutes. Okay, I'm Stan Anderson. I'm president of the Salgus body. Uh, and we have some board members here. I'm going to take the time to let them introduce themselves. Uh, those of you who are residents of Marina Bay, gosh, good to see you. Uh, the neighborhood council is something that... Uh, uh, you really ought to consider uh, being more involved with if you aren't now, and enough of the commercial. Um, our first candidate for mayor, Melvin Willis. For mayor. <laughs> Tom, by, by default. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate this seven minute thing. I have one question. Brilliant. I don't know who thought that up. I want to give you credit for it. So, so I'm going to take this a little different direction, I think, than you're used to hearing. Um, you know, what is Richmond's biggest problem? Most people will start talking about things like crime, housing, homelessness, streets, um, uh, parks, uh, programs for youth, and on and on and on. But you know what? None of those are problems. They're symptoms. And what they're a symptom of is a city that is chronically underfunded. You know, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, the number of employees in the city of Richmond has gone down about, about 30 percent, 20, 30 percent. And of course, the population of Richmond has continued, continued to rise. So what we're trying to do is we're doing we're trying to do more and more, and we're trying to do more for more people with less and less money and less and less employees. So, if you, if, you know, one of the things I hear most often from people is, I need more patrols in my neighborhood. They're breaking into my cars. They're stealing my stuff. They're speeding. They're doing donuts. You know, those kind of things. And those are problems. Most people think those as problems, but they're symptoms of a city that's underfunded. And people in Richmond expect the same services that people in other cities expect. They expect to get the same level of service that they would get in El Cerrito or Hercules or Walnut Creek or anywhere else. They don't understand why, uh, why they're not getting that in Richmond. And I I'm going to tell you really briefly why. <coughs> of 101 
cities in the nine county Bay Area, Richmond has, Richmond is like in the top three of, of low median family income. There's not a lot of money floating around Richmond. We're, the place you get money to run a city primarily are two places, property taxes, retail sales taxes. If you don't have a lot of money, you're not going to have a lot of retail sales going on. If your property values are low, you're not going to get, you're not going to get a lot of money in property taxes. Now, how low, let me just show you something here. In Richmond, the median family income is $54,000 annually. The median home price is $507,000. Next door, across the street in El Cerrito, the median family income is $92,000, almost twice as much. And the uh, median home value is $903,000, again, a little less than twice as much. So, you know, your average home in El Cerrito is paying twice the property taxes of your average home in Richmond. And when you crack all the numbers out, you'll find that that Richmond just is not, is not producing the revenue it takes to provide people the services they need. That's the crux of the problem. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Uh, you know, the predictions are that in, uh, in the next five years, the amount, uh, the amount of money paid to um, uh, OPEB and, and pension benefits in, for Richmond public employees is going to take up 40% of our budget. So, the next part of that question is, okay, what's the answer? There really is only one answer, and that answer is to grow the economy. You know, we have to start building enrichment, we have to bring in businesses, we have to bring in jobs, we have to create retail activity, and we've got to get that revenue enrichment up to what other cities have. And uh, there are a few candidates that are talking about that. And uh, one of the reasons is, is that some of our candidates don't like economic activity. They don't want to grow the economy. To them, corporations are evil. Landlords are greedy. Profit is a bad word. But you know what? Um, everything we do that's going to create revenue for Richmond to pay for the programs we want to pay for is going to take public-private partnerships. We have to work with the private sector because only the private sector can, can build and grow our economy. The city's not going to do it. So just to sum up, the biggest problem here are, are not all these symptoms. The biggest problem is that we're in, we're, we're in a financial crunch that's not sustainable. We have to find solutions. And the only solution out there that's really going to work is to grow the, is to grow the economy. Uh, and, you know, uh, I've heard some candidates talk about uh, uh, talk about, well, we need to spend more money on this, or we need to spend more money on that, or we need to create a new program. You know, we spend more money on rent control than we spend on libraries. Uh, and if we keep going that direction, people are not going to get the kind of serv services they need. And again, I hear, I hear candidates talk about moving money around, like uh, my, uh, uh, my challenger for the, for the mayor's race said last year, uh, Willis said he would like to cut the police department budget and reallocate some of its remaining funding to city youth programs. Well, look, youth programs are great. Everybody wants youth programs. Everybody wants more police. It's a zero, as long as we don't have any additional money, it's a zero-sum game. So, in closing, what we have to do is we really have to focus on growing the economy in Richmond, and we've got to do everything possible uh, to do that. Thank you. How you doing? Hi. Doing all right? Good. I'm church in Kansas. That's okay. That's okay. And Melvin Willis. Well, good evening there, everybody. Forgive me for my tardiness. I was asked to make a quick little presentation at Kensington and rushed here as much as possible, so I might sound a little out of breath but during this. So uh, my name is uh, Melvin Willis. I grew up here in Richmond, attended the public schools, and actually for the past uh, seven years I've been a community organizer with Ace Alliance of California for Community Empowerment. So part of what my job has been doing is just actually going around door knocking community members, identifying what some of the issues and concerns happen in communities, and figuring out how we 
come together to bring collective power, to bring, get power in numbers to actually make a difference. Because one of the things that I discovered as I've been organizing is that there's plenty of people in the city of Richmond that have issues and concerns, but there's a lot of folks that don't really know how to plug in and actually get involved. They just sit here with this issue and feel isolated within it. And it's always been my job to identify who those folks are and bring them together with their neighbors who are sharing the same issue and actually at the same time not only create communities but building new community leaders within the city. And because through that process there's been a lot of issues that have popped up uh, talking to folks. At the time when I first started was the uh, foreclosure crisis and neighborhood blight and how that was causing safety concerns in the community. Then it was the affordability of health care before we had the Affordable Care Act and not many folks were able to get access to health care. And then in 2015, 2016, a lot of tenants were approaching me with uh, rent increases anywhere between $50 to $600 in one year. Some folks that were living in single family homes went from their rent being $1,500 a month to $3,000 a month just with a simple rent increase. Everything that I've done in this community has always had community input. It's always been working together with neighbors to identify the solution and not really making a move unless there's a community support behind a certain vision. And in that time, since I've been working and organizing, we were able to go after <coughs> banks to fight for loan modifications and principal reductions to where a lot of homeowners were able to stay in their homes after they took a chance and fought back. We uh, organized a bunch of workshops to let people know about the Affordable Care Act and where they fell into that bracket and made sure people knew when the enrollment dates were and even brought counselors to enroll people in health care because not a lot of people knew what the Affordable Care Act meant for them. And also a, a good population of folks didn't know about this thing called the Low Income Health Care Program, which was a county program to bridge the gap between folks that couldn't qualify for Medi-Cal or Medicare, but it was to bridge the gap to get them until the Affordable Care Act came into play. And it was my job to reach out to those folks and let them know that these services were available. And even in the past year, I was working collaboratively with the Racial Justice Coalition to fight against the jail expansion because we knew it was going to be 20, million, 20 to $25 million of the county's budget going to expand the jail, which would be $5 million extra in operations every single year. Unfortunately, our county board of supervisor, John Joy, was the only person to take opposition to that because we said the county needs to spread its money in other areas, like mental health services, for instance, preventing recidivism and actually put it into play put it into mental health services to make sure that people didn't get into incarceration, that we were doing everything we can to prevent it. But that sparked a big conversation also within the county too, where more folks started to get engaged in what was happening in Contra Costa's politics. It led to us finally ending the ICE contracts that the sheriff had at the West Contra Costa detention facility. And at the same time, we found out that juveniles were being charged fines and fees regardless of if they were convicted of a crime or not, and not only did we work together to push to get them to end that practice, but those families are going to be paid back. I believe coming together to get power numbers to make a difference is what it takes to actually move a city forward or move a county forward to have true democracy because it takes more than seven people on the board to really make a difference. It takes us actually being able to work together with folks collaboratively to solve these complicated issues that are affecting Richmond and a lot of them are nationwide crises that we are victims of. That's why I organized tenants to pass the first rent control just cause for eviction measure in Contra Costa County's history in the past, I mean, California's history in the past 30 years and gathered 600,000 signatures statewide for Prop 10 on the ballot because stabilizing rents and stabilizing neighborhoods helps promote public safety and to the comment that my opponent ended up saying about 20% uh, of uh, the police budget to go to youth programs and services, that's because public safety has about 60% of our budget and I'm trying to find an equitable balance to where we're investing in our youth into preventing crime from happening to begin with as opposed to over policing our communities. For me, true public safety comes from investing services into our community and not just over policing them. 
I'm running for mayor because I want to work collaboratively with community members to come up with great solutions to be able to make a difference, which is why I also sit on the homeless task force, which we've been able to make headway on a lot of the issues that are affecting homelessness, and even got a few areas cleaned up that have been a blight and a nuisance to the community as well. My top issues I wanted to, uh, some candidates have already said this, and I want to make it a priority for me too to work with the trade unions to bring them into school so if kids don't want to go to college they can have a a pathway into the workforce straight out of high school, invest in the youth programs and services and the kind of developments I want to focus on when it comes to housing is mixed use housing to help desegregate our communities so we can have affordability components and market rate components as opposed to being segregated by income. And the only developments I'm interested in coming to Richmond are the developments that are actually going to be invested in the community. I don't want islands of opportunity. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, moving right along. Um, that's our two uh, mayoral, mayoral candidates. Uh, and now we begin our city council candidates. Again, my random shuffling of people, Ada Racinos is our next speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Ada Racinos. I'm Sorry. proud to be a daughter of immigrants who came here in the 80s seeking asylum from the Salvadoran Civil War. Um, and it has largely framed what I'm presenting to you tonight, which is one of our biggest problems, but also one of our biggest opportunities in the city of Richmond. Affordable housing as a nexus for financial stability of our families and our individuals. I think that that needs to be where we place um, most of our attention and most of our work. We need to create prosperity, and you create prosperity by investing deeply in keeping people where they are. And I know this because I'm a Latina, and Latinos outspend the majority of folks. They invest a lot of money in shopping, in eating out, and economic development. And if we have stable rents, we will invest that back in the community. We've done it for decades and years, and as a population that continues to grow, that is currently about 40% of Richmond, um, and getting larger and younger, we will continue to invest back in our communities when we have stability in the home. And so, how do we do that? We prevent displacement. I am a supporter of rent control for that reason. I think that we have an opportunity to keep people where they are and keep them stable so that we can move towards a community that doesn't spend a large proportion of their income only on housing. Because that leaves that extra percent that folks spend investing, uh, purchasing homes, purchasing goods, um, and investing back in their kids for college. So I'm a large advocate not only for rent control, but the expansion. I'm supportive of Proposition 10. I am also supportive of deeper investment in our public housing. We know the federal government has decided to disinvest from public housing as a whole. Vouchers are getting lower. Section 8 is becoming a program that's harder to get into. We have a responsibility to show up for our lowest income residents and make sure that we maintain the standards of housing uh, um, and um, invest in their upkeep. So one of the opportunities we have is to use linkage fees that are applied to commercial developments strategically. We have some economic areas that are up and coming like Main Street and 23rd Street that already bring a lot of sales tax revenue. And we can market it as an opportunity for folks to come in, plan with the community, and bring either new businesses or grow other businesses. We can use them as a tool to create funding streams for landlords that need financial support for repairs and maintenance. That's a great opportunity that we can take advantage of. Another thing that we need to do is create, we need to build more opportunities for housing at all income levels. And I think that that starts with us acknowledging that we are a low income community. That offers us a couple of things. An opportunity to create deep investment in the people who are already here, who bring us diversity, we can also implement our in lieu fees to make them very competitive so that it becomes a very difficult choice for the developer to say, is it better for me to pay these fees or should I just build the affordable housing? So that we can be strategic about fighting gentrification in our downtown areas. We can create simple marketing plans uh, with our Economic Development Com Commission and some of our nonprofits in the area so that we can develop hotspots 
for developers to feel like there's going to be someone who will be a concierge for them if they're interested in coming into our commercial areas. We also need to begin incorporating equity principles that include everyone at the table because for a really long time planning has been very exclusive. I think that we have a large opportunity to invest in Main Street and 23rd Street that has a lot of vacant lots, it has a lot of vacant commercial buildings, and it has a lot of vacant opportunities to build housing as well. We need to find and cultivate community-minded developers. That is a large responsibility that the City Council has taken on and we're currently working on. We need to find developers who are socially minded, want to partner with us, and want to get to know our residents so that when we approach them with ideas about how we want development done, they will be just as enthusiastic as we are. I'm also a strong supporter of project labor agreements. We need to make sure that we bring those at the table so that we're investing in our uh, Richmond Build program and expanding it. We also need to do a couple of things while we're working on that. We need to use a community plan to search for businesses and amenities that align with our vision. We also have to advocate for regional and state funding to build more affordable housing. We also have to continue the fight to implement and steer more money towards infrastructure and the maintenance of our streets. We need to build complete streetscapes that acknowledge that not only is this a transit-oriented city with people in their cars, we want to be able to walk it. A lot of the entrepreneurs on 23rd Street want people to stop by their shops. And if we make it friendly for them to be able to walk because there's trees and shade and now there's bike lanes for the kids, they're going to be more invested in facade improvements. And then we also have to be able to match those facade improvement grants. We have to be able to meet our small business entrepreneurs where they are. And last but not least, we need to build relationships with alternative housing experts. This is an opportunity that we have to not only create community land trusts and co-ops, but to think outside the box about what's possible when we center our current residents as developers. If we connect them and say, these are the skills that you need in order to bring your vision to the table, we will all benefit. When we do this, we are not only supporting our renters, we're building a pipeline so that renters can eventually become homeowners again. As a millennial, I feel the crushing kind of distancing of the home uh, that was once promised as an American dream. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that people can stay where they are so they can save the money to invest in themselves and in us as a community. And more importantly, their children. And so, with that being said, I think affordable housing continues to be a challenge, but it's also one of the most exciting things that we can all get involved in. Because when one family has financial stability, we're all going to be together, united, and excited about investing that extra money in all the things that are going to bring us more revenue. Thank you. Thank you all so much for uh, coming out here tonight. Um, I think We've heard and we will hear more a surprising degree of unanimity on what our big problems are. The affordability crisis, the crime, et cetera, et cetera. But when you go to vote on November 6th, the question is, which one of us, the 13 of us running for council, which one of us is really going to be able to work effectively on those issues? And I want to talk a little bit about my record. First, Chevron's not very popular, taxes aren't very popular. I'm going to start out with that. I negotiated, along with Mayor Butt, the 2000 in Jail Myrick, with support from uh, Nat Bates, the 2014 Chevron Modernization Agreement. Chevron was polling negative four to one at that point. I lost my seat after that election. But look at the agreement. The agreement was the best agreement on a modernization project of that type in the history of the United States. I don't care if you're talking about the pollution controls, the safety, getting these old decrepit tankers off the hillsides, the $90 million in community benefits, which we got, $35 million for the Richmond Scholarship Program, a ton of uh, desperately needed blue collar jobs, uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So we went in and we negotiated that and having had experience starting a successful small business, as did uh, Mirabai. 
we stayed away from the areas which could have sent Chevron walking away from the deal. If they walk away from the deal, no money, no jobs, no safety improvements, no greenhouse gas improvements, and a bunch of decrepit 50-year-old tanks sitting there on the hillside and possibly exploding. <coughs> I want to talk about another controversial area, taxes. Who here likes taxes? Anybody want to raise their hand? Okay, I don't like taxes, you probably don't like taxes. But like going to the dentist, sometimes they're necessary. In the early 2000s, we had a crisis. We had police going out the door. We had libraries closed. We had fire stations closed. I worked with the community, worked with my colleagues, and I spearheaded two taxes. They raised about $13 million a year. What they had in common was they were primarily paid for by big business. Uh, one of them, Chevron, paid about 56%. Uh, heavy industry paid 65%. That was utility tax. <coughs> They're paid for largely by big businesses, by people who have a lot of money, and by people from out of town. We got those passed. We brought back the police. We brought back the libraries, we reopened the fire stations, and we had money for other programs. One of which, by the way, was a great program which I've been advocating for, which was the Office of Neighborhood Safety. And something caused a huge drop in Richmond's crime rate. We don't know exactly what it is, but I think that the Office of Neighborhood Safety was probably one of those factors. It's been duplicated, it's been exported to Oakland, and I think it's worked. It's getting people who are not uniformed officers, some of whom have been involved in the same lifestyle as the people who are out of risk, out in the corner, tapping on the shoulder, saying, hey, option, we've got a better option for you. We have the chance to move forward in Richmond. We need leadership which is not <coughs> ideological, which doesn't see the world in black and white. My parents were both straight A, Ivy League, science students. <coughs> I do not see the world in black and white. I see it in a, sh a number of tones of gray. It's a complex world, and I don't go up to the council and make speeches where I put out five-second sound bites and stuff that sounds good. I talk about nuanced solutions. Let me give you an example. We're all going to talk tonight about the need to keep businesses. Richmond had a minimum wage law, and the businesses that I work closely with came to me and said, hey, Jim, this is a problem. Uh, Galaxy Desserts in particular, 200 person job expansion, they said, if we get hit with this full minimum wage, we probably can't do it. <coughs> I introduced an amendment that said that manufacturers, the people who actually can pick up their bags and move out of town, or cancel planned expansions, that the manufacturers would still have a increase in the minimum wage, but wouldn't be as large as the one we passed. That amendment was accepted, none of those manufacturers left. The full weight of the increase went on to the people who frankly couldn't leave and who have more money than they know what to do with. We're talking about the McDonald's, the Costco's, the Walmarts. They're not going anywhere. So using my experience being in business, having a uh, business that employed about 25 people, I was able to understand the economics of that and come up with that solution. We have public financing in Richmond today. That's because I brought it there. As a member of California Common Cause as the vice chair, I became deeply convinced that that's probably the best money that we spend in our city budget. Unfortunately, after I left the council, it got cut in half. I think that was a bad decision. I understand the financial pressures. But I think it's important that you elect people and that you have a fair playing field and that you don't wind up with candidates who get elected merely because there is a ton of money going one way or the other. We have people today who are going through the Brad Moody underpass. A lot of people are, are part of that. But as a council member, when that idea came up, I called together an ad hoc committee. We got together the people from the neighborhood, the businesses, the railroads, and we worked through the different issues, of a lot of divergence of opinion, and we came up with a plan we agreed on, which was underpass, not overpass. The city staff, with a unified community behind us, then went out, shopped around for the money, got the money. We have the um, underpass now. It's not only a convenience issue, and I used to live in Marina Bay for about uh, 12 years. It's not only a convenience issue, it can be a life or death issue. If we have emergency vehicles, 
that are stopped for the trains for 10 minutes, people could have a heart attack and die and whatever. It's an example of how I feel my job as a council member is not just to sit up there and look at on Tuesday night, vote yes, vote no, but it's to go out in the community, engage people, move forward with issues that matter. Nuts and bolts issues. We're not talking about the um, space-based mind control <coughs> weapon kind of thing. We're not talking about the uh, eminent domain plan, which was put forward to try to save underwater people who had underwater mortgages. I oppose both of those very strongly. The eminent domain plan, by the way, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to the city budget. Does anybody know how many homes were saved by the eminent domain plan? Anybody know? Heard a guess? Okay, zero, none. Complete waste of money, silliness. And once again, it's the difference between somebody. Thank you, Thank you very much for your Eduardo Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies, I'm uh, uh, under the weather, so, so I'll try to be clear, concise. Uh, my name is Eduardo Martinez. What? Can you get on the other side of the table? <laughs> I'm, I'm shooting up your nose. Thanks. Very good. Oh, much better. Yes, thank you. No, so uh, my name is Eduardo Martinez. I'm on the Michigan City Council. And the biggest problem that Richmond has is finances, not just in the city budget, but also in the community. So both of those need to be tackled. Uh, but in order for the city to maintain a balanced budget, we need to do smart planning. We can't just plan at will. For instance, uh, we have the issue of annexing north of Richmond. Uh, doing that will create a million dollar structural deficit. And if you go to North Richmond and you see the part that's in Richmond and the part that's in the county, you can't tell the difference. So the question is, the, the people who live in North Richmond are asking themselves, why should I pay more taxes if I don't get improved services? So the question is, why are we so eager to annex North Richmond when we know it's going to hurt the budget? The other bad planning is Point Bellotti. People look at Point Bellotti and they say that this is going to be a financial godsend. But the cost of infrastructure and the cost of building is so phenomenal that it basically will have to be its own community to exist. And Richmond will get nothing out of it. And possibly uh, uh, we'll have to sign on to a bond to pay for the, the uh, uh, building. Now, we have a major problem in police staffing. And if you look at the situation, we do need more police. But we don't need more police because we need more police in terms of uh, uh, fighting crime. We need more police in terms of covering the territory. Richmond and Berkeley have the same population, approximately. Berkeley has about 20 more police than Richmond. But the difference is that Richmond police have to cover three times the land area, which means that in order to respond over here, if you're over here, it's going to take 15 to half an hour. So, so, so uh, how are you going to deal with that? Uh, uh, in the city of Memphis, uh, they are de-annexing areas because the area that is de-annexing realized that the city did not have the finances to provide the services. So it was a mutual agreement, you know, that's part separate ways because you're not meeting our needs and you're taking our money. And, and, and Memphis realized that they couldn't provide the services. So, so at some point, we planned a Richmond that is so spread out with communities so far apart from each other that it's impossible to provide the kinds of services that we need. And yet we're looking at taking on more areas outside of the general uh, populated areas of Richmond. So in order to counter that, we need to focus on infill. We need to make sure that, that we build on McDonald Avenue. We build the empty lots on 23rd Street. 
and all the other laws that are creating points of, of uh, abatement. People just come to the empty lots, they dump. In fact, I had one lot cleaned up. Three days later, stuff is there. So, so um, if, that, if that lot was used for a home, that dumping would stop. But uh, I, uh, I, I looked at Rebecca Kaplan's um, uh, language, which became Measure T for, for the city of Richmond, and I highly recommend that we do that, because the lack of money in the communities is what's creating homelessness. It's also uh, 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 creating major abatement issues with, with empty lots and, and people not having the services that they need. So um, in 2012, there was a charrette done about <coughs> McDonald Avenue. And in that charrette, they found that people who lived half a mile on either side of McDonald Avenue spent over 75% of their expendable income outside of Richmond. And the question was, why don't you spend it in Richmond? And the answer is, there's no place to spend it. So we need to create businesses in Richmond that will keep that money in Richmond. I'm also working on a regional public bank with the city of Berkeley, Oakland, Alameda County, and San Francisco. So we're in talks about that. And if we can get that to go, all of the interest that is collected will remain in the community as opposed to going out to, to uh, a major inter, you know, international multi, multi, multinational corporations. So uh, a regional public bank is essential. Uh, having uh, focusing on, on uh, infill and um, job training is also in, an important uh, issue in education. So I'm working with the city, with with the Uni West Country Coast Unified School District and the county to create a, a, a neighborhood engagement policy, and we want to push for uh, uh, for schools that provide uh, wraparound services. And I'm also pushing to have the nurses come in and do a nursing program at one of our high schools so that our students when they graduate can go into the nursing field because we have a dearth of people doing those jobs. So I don't know if that's the... No. No? Okay. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so so um, I, I hope that you'll vote for me. Uh, I've, I feel that I've done an adequate job uh, in, in working for transparency. Uh, I don't believe we have had enough transparency in the city uh, affairs. And uh, we're here for you. We don't need a patriarchal government that decides things for you. We need a government that is community-based, has conversations with all of its constituents, and works for solutions that is for the benefit of everyone. So once again, I hope you vote for me. Thank you so much. Next up, the name Oh, you tried. <laughs> so hello all. Thank you so much for coming out here. Uh, some of you may not know me, so I'll start with a bit about myself. Uh, now I've I've been a teacher, a lawyer, and a software engineer, and I am where I am because of all the help I got. So it, I, I was brought up in India, where if you are blind, you don't get many government services. I was very dependent on friends, volunteers to help me. And these were you know, people like my classmates who would read to me four hours at a stretch, six hours at a stretch. And that is why, that is why I'm here. And, that is why, and I can't help them in return, so I try to help other people. And so, that is why I'm a writer coach. Um, I very, uh, work one-on-one -on -one with students on their writing assignments. That is why uh, my wife and I, we were mentors at RPAL, where you mentor at-risk youth. Uh, that is why I serve on the Crime Prevention Board, where we build better police community relations, best way to 
actually fight crime. So if you have a problem, we are the ones who help you to set up a neighborhood watch group, give you all the information about what you can do to keep yourselves and your neighborhood safe. Uh, and that is why I'm running for city council. Now, so in terms of the big problem, so as you can tell, you know, my, the, the thing that is really close to my heart is education. And so I, uh, one of the things that pleased me the most was that I was able to pass the Richmond Promise Program, which gives a $1,500 per year scholarship to all our students <coughs> to go to college or go for vocational training. Uh, because we need that shift. We need to, the shift to a college-going culture. Uh, now, in, in terms of the biggest problem, getting back to that, it really is uh, city finances. And there are different aspects to it. So one of the things is we really got to manage our finances well. And I'll give you a simple example. Okay? I served on city council in 2015 and 2016. In 2014, the city government, uh, I mean, the city council passed a budget. Well, they didn't have the money, so they did something called a swaption, which is a loan disguised as a refinancing so that it can become legal because you're not supposed to borrow to just uh, balance your budget. Okay? So they basically borrowed $9 million. Uh, the financial forecast looked, looked really bad, so what did they do? They suppressed it, they didn't make it public. Well, in 15, Moody's looked at these two things, no financial forecast, borrowed money to balance the budget, they downgraded us to junk bond status. What happened? That $9 million that we had borrowed in 2014, we had to pay $16 million on that in 2015. We did not have the money, of course, so we had to put out a bond. And that means that the total payment is going to be between 25 to 30 million. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, because uh, our uh, because we got downgraded to junk bond status, uh, it uh, we had these swaps. So the swap payment became due. As a consequence, we had to do another refinancing, which would cost the city an additional between 10 to 30 million dollars depending on where future interest rates go. Now, why did this happen? Part of it is, city council simply would say, oh, finances aren't my thing. You can do that kind of thing, OK? Uh, from 2008, after the uh, big um, uh, financial crisis, as you know, interest rates are very low, right? We, we could have had our money at about 3%. Guess how much we were paying because we did swap. We were paying interest of over 7%. Why were we doing this? Again, because folks on the council, finances on their thing. And so their approach is, I want this, and I don't care how you get the money. That has got to stop. Okay, so what did I do when I was on council? So I led the fight for a really balanced budget instead of a budget balanced by borrowing money. The other thing I did was, you know, because we really conveyed the seriousness of the issue to everybody, we managed to get concessions from our public safety and management unions. I don't know how many of you. Folks know this, but because of that agreement, actually our firefighters on average agreed to a take-home pay cut of $6,000 per year. Okay, this is an economic boom time. Our police officers got, took, took a cut of about $4,000. So now, what do we need to do? The key thing is, really, we need to build Hilltop properly. It's entitled for 9,000 units, that could be a project of about $5 billion, which means that could add $20 million just in property taxes. That is something that we absolutely have to do properly. The other thing we need to do is have a full audit. So that way we know exactly which parts of our budget 
are used correctly, which parts are not used correctly. So those are the things that we absolutely need to do. You can bank on me for doing those things. Again, overseeing a $168 million budget is the most important job of the city council member. You've got to figure out whom you can trust to do it. So, again, I humbly ask for your vote. I ask for your support because um, now I don't have a... Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Eleanor Johnson. Thompson. I'm sorry, Carol Johnson. <laughs> I'll get my glasses on the screen. Hello, how's everybody doing? Right. Oh, I am feeling a little under the weather. I've been dealing with the, this really bad allergy attack for the last two or three days. But first, let me introduce myself for those who don't know me. I'm originally from San Francisco, but I've lived in Richmond for the past 22 years. And I'm happily married with three daughters and a son. And while I was in college, I thought I was headed for law school, but God had other plans. So um, I had, you know, received the news that two of my cousins had been shot and killed in Richmond, and a number of friends, you know, from, for our family had also um, lost their lives. So after all of that, and it does cause a lot of trauma, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I got personally involved in 2006, and... Um, you know, I've been involved in the community ever since, um, not just with gun violence, but also with raising the minimum wage, um, banning the box, so that uh, that's the box on job applications that formerly incarcerated people they have to put if they have convictions, and that often keeps them from getting jobs. So we need to give them the tools that they need when, when, you know, after they serve their time so they can get ahead and turn their lives around. And also, I was active in protesting the jail expansion and reducing homeless. I'm current, you know, homelessness. I'm currently on the homeless task force. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. I will continue to do the same, regardless of whether I'm on the city council or still out in the community. And what I feel is the biggest problem facing Richmond is the um, crime prevention, you know, and also violence prevention. So I feel the biggest way to handle that would be to take a comprehensive approach. It is not just a job for the police. The community has to get involved, the faith leaders, and um, just anybody who's concerned, anybody living in the, the city of Richmond is affected by this. Kids can't go out and play and they don't feel safe anymore, you know what I mean? And um, there's a lot that's going to go into that. We have to provide resources for formerly incarcerated people. We cannot continue to ignore them because society benefits when we, you know, give them the tools they need. They need education, job training, substance abuse counseling, mental health services, all of these things. That's why it takes a comprehensive approach. And um, just encouraging people to get out and, you know, talk with their neighbors, have stronger neighborhood watch groups, and possibly patrolling, not just, uh, not necessarily every week, but maybe once or twice a month to just, you know, you know, show people that, you know, it, it can be a safer community. I know it's not just gentrification that needs to happen for communities to be safer. So there is a lot, and I will continue to do all I can. So if you if if you vote for me, you will get the same that I what I've been doing for 11 years and so much more. Thank you. Okay, we'll try this again. Uh -huh. Eleanor Thompson. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me here on tonight. I'm Eleanor Thompson. I'm a native of Arkansas. And I have lived in Richmond for over 50 years, city of Richmond for over 50 years. And I got involved in 1991. We had 64 murders in the city of Richmond. And I know that somebody may say maybe safety and that may not be an issue. But when you have young men dying in the street, it becomes an issue. 64 in one year. Um, I created a program, a nonprofit. I founded in 1991, received 501c3 in 1993. And that program started because of the murders in Richmond. 
And that program had young men and young women who came every evening just to have a safe place to go out of the street so that they wouldn't be one of the uh, victims of crime. And also I received a, a, a grant from Office of Neighborhood Safety so that we could work with young men who hung out on the corner because if they, they're inside doing a job, then they're not outside committing crime. We may have murders in our residence, but you may have break-ins and things like that. So all crime is, you know, a crime is a crime, and it hurts somebody, no matter who it is. Um, also, I think that safety is one of our number one issues, because we used to say in my neighborhood, if everybody's dead, we don't need nothing else. So safety <laughs> becomes an issue. Um, and then we have the homeless. You know, it started out with maybe one tent over here and, and maybe a couple of people sitting on the street, but now you see the tents are growing. They are growing. There are many tents. If you go down the street and you ride around, you see people laying down on the sidewalk and everything. And we shouldn't have to have people sleeping outside. When we have the uh, problem to solve those things, we have lots, empty vacant lots, where they can put uh, tiny homes on there. Uh, Mayor Butt uh, mentioned Taney Homes, and I thought it was a good idea at the time that he mentioned it, uh, to put those homes for homeless people. We want to clean up our city. We don't want people riding through, because when I ride through Oakland and I see all those homeless people out there, it's just really terrible. We haven't got there yet, but if we don't do something about it now, we're going to get there too. So uh, we need to build homes for the homeless and get them off the street. Uh, one of the other things that we can do for our youth, a lot of youth want to start jobs. Sometimes people say they don't want to work. They're out there, they don't want to work. But you know, I found a lot of them that really do want to work. And a police officer once said, he said, I told a young man, when you get out of jail, because he arrested him, he said, when you come out, you come and see me. He said, when the young man got out, he went to see him. He said, but he didn't have anything to offer him. So we have to have something to offer the youth because the youth are the ones out, young adults, young men, they're the ones that have committed most of the crimes in Richmond. So we want to make Richmond safe, let's give the youth a job. Because there's a saying, nothing stops a, a good like a job. So let's try to give our youth and young men a job so that they stay off the street. And then um, in order for our young people or adults or any, you know, they want to start a business. Right now it's kind of hard. It's hard because they, the city makes it hard for them to get that uh, small business loan. And I think they should release that small business loan, not have the people have to wait a year before they can get the loan to be able to open the business. And if you have young people who want to open a business, I think we should make that available to them and not have them wait a year. But let's try to figure out a way so they can get it right away and try to figure out a way so we can help them to uh, open that business. Um, and also the police department. We say we don't need, uh, we can't have, we have safety, but we don't need uh, the police to have to do it all. And that's true. The police cannot do it all. But we need to always have a full police staff. The police department should be fully staffed at all times. I believe that the police department and the fire department, those um, departments should be fully staffed, right? Because they are the one we're going to call when we need help, right? They're the one we're going to call when somebody's sick and laying on the floor. So they should be fully staffed so that they will be able to serve the Richmond uh, community and not be lacked or not have to, uh, you know, not get there on time. But I've also, okay. I've Founded a nonprofit in 1991, and I served on the police commission, uh, Contra Costa County Democratic Party. I was an elected member. Uh, so thank you. I was an elected member. I've also served on anti-drug task force for the city of Richmond. Uh, I'm a substitute teacher for the Richmond Unified School District and for the uh, John Sweat School District. Uh, former. Um, police community member, and that was during the time of Chief Lansdowne when he did the policy for uh, community policing. 
And I believe that his community policing was one of the best because my children would always be able to go out to the gate and wait for the officer to come by because they were coming by either on bicycle or coming by on foot. So I believe his was one of the best. Uh, I was a recipient of a proclamation for, from Honorable Gail McLaughlin. I also received the Citizen of the Year Award from Honorable mm -hmm. Mary, Rosemary Corbin and also the award for community service from, uh, for the George Carroll Community Service Award. Thank you. Oh, both of you. The community leader that gets things done. I've been involved in my community for many, many years. I'll go back a little bit in time. I was raised here in the Richmond since I was a kid. I was uh, brought to the United States when I was eight years old. I did not speak any English. Jumping around a few years later, I come out, I get kicked out from my family's home, and my whole family. I pick myself back up, I purchased my home when I was 22 years old, and since then, I became the president of my HOA. From there, working alongside another neighboring HOA, we created the Hilltop District Homeowners and Stakeholders Association, which is, is an association that I think is unique, where we bring the homeowners and the businesses and the largest business district in the city, Hilltop, we bring them all together to be able to deal with their issues, to have a conversation, but most importantly, to be able to deal and manage the $1 million budget we have up there for the Landscape Maintenance District. You all have one here as well. The city of Richmond has two special districts. Hilltop was created first. You guys were created second uh, because you guys wanted it. We were pushed into it. Uh, you guys have half a million dollars. And that's sort of how I started get to get to know your community. With our community getting together, trying to figure out where our money was going. And then you got, we came together a few years ago to get a new uh, company to ma help manage the funds. I stayed involved and that sort of gave me a little bit of insight into the budget process. If we have one million dollars and we don't know where it's at, we can't figure out how it's being used. What's happening with the rest of the city? We were able to figure out to go from paper timesheets into electronic timesheets for our employees. And I say our employees, those in the landscape district at Hilltop. We were able to figure out that we were spending over $80,000 in commute time, going from Hilltop to downtown to pick up their tools, only to go back up and then work, only to stop a few hours before the day is over so they can pack up and come back down and come back up. At that time, they were saying, we need to make cuts. We need to cut one person. <clears throat> well, through that electronic system, we were able to figure out $80,000. We saved one person. And we were able to save over $70,000 from there. Now we spend $10,000 in a courtyard at Hilltop. Right? It shouldn't be a, a weird idea or out of the box idea, it should be common sense, but sometimes we don't always have it. So we need someone to be able to look at things, ways that they haven't been looked at before. There was a park at Hilltop. It took 17 years to build. <laughs> they brought rock by rock by rock. <laughs> We had to figure out after the community said, what is this big old dirt pile on the corner of Richmond Parkway and San Pablo Avenue? Mm -hmm. It took me calling the developer at that time, and the receptionist was so glad. She was like, oh my god, I remember this project like it was yesterday. <laughs> she emailed me copies of faxes, this is how long ago it was, of conversations, and you can see where the ball was dropped. We helped pick it up. We now have a park up there. And not only do we have a park, but we build community there. During the holiday time, we get together 
and we put holiday lights around over 50 trees that we planted there. One time there was a person from uh, across the bay who was there eating, I guess she was commuting. She comes over, and she comes over, she says, Caesar, what's going on? Because we had a lot of police officers there. And I'm like, we're putting holiday lights up. She's like, did somebody get murdered? I'm like, no, we're putting holiday lights up. <laughs> She's like, are you sure? I'm like, yes. She's like, why? I'm like, because it's the holidays and it's what we do. She's like, but the cops are here. I'm like, they're part of our community. <laughs> right, so for her, it was Richmond and it was scary. So we have to change. The question is, what is one of the biggest problems facing Richmond? Nobody wants to come to Richmond because they're afraid. The investors, I was very involved with the mall development. We're trying to bring in a new investor. I talked to one of the investors, and I said, come to Richmond. They said, no. We don't drive through Richmond. We don't stop in Richmond. We don't do anything in Richmond. I said, perfect. Let's have coffee in Richmond. I am persistent. I am known by some It's very pushy. I had her translated. I am persistent. I do not take no for an answer. If you tell me no, I translate it differently. It is not N-O, it is K-N-O-W. You do not know enough about our community to want to come into it and be able to invest and give us the opportunities that our community needs. We are the diamond in the rough. We have to be able to pick ourselves up. We must think outside the box. We must think together as a community. And again, being able to go from paper to electronic should not be a thing of uh, 2018, right? We should have done this years ago. We have to see where our money is going. The mall did a study. We have about $6 billion not stopping in Richmond. That is both us who live here and people that travel through Highway 80, Highway 580, Highway 4. Imagine, as Renee was saying, if we just get a little bit of that, how much beautiful can our city be? Thank you so much. I hope I'll be able to honor your vote. All right. Okay, Douglas Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Not quite. Zach changed his name. He says, I'm Johnson. Good evening. Good evening. And good evening to you all. My name is Douglas Johnson III, and I am running for Richmond City Council. I'm a fourth generation Richmond resident. My great grandparents came up to work in the Kaiser Shipyards. My grandfather was the owner of the Savoy Nightclub in North Richmond, and I've been, we've been here ever since. In addition to being a fourth generation Richmond resident, I'm also a fourth generation union member. I'm a proud shop steward for Team Sub Local 856, so I'm most definitely proud of my union roots. And my platform includes economic empowerment, community engagement, and most definitely public safety. On the public safety side, I feel in addition to reducing gun violence and increasing community policing, we have to increase mental and trauma health services in the city of Richmond. And in addition to that, we have to in, in, increase excuse me, maternity and health services in the city of Richmond as well. That's my public safety approach. For me, public safety is a holistic approach. In addition to assisting with the external, we must also assist with the internal. And then on the community engagement side, it looks just like this. After November 6th, you will, I will not disappear on you. I know many of you probably got my phone call before you came over here, and you probably maybe even got my letter, my um, palm card in your door. But I promise you, after November 6th, Dennis Johnson will not disappear on you. I'm a young man with enough energy to get around this city and meet with neighborhoods outside of Tuesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> and then that last piece, economic empowerment, I think that's how we answer the biggest problem in the city of Richmond, which I think is the city's finances. Right now, we have over $600 million in unpaid pension. We have $100,000 in unpaid bond measures, and not to mention a stretch in city services. And that's police, landscaping, engineering, who pave the roads. In order for us to get the money to pave the roads, to trim the hedges and cut the grass, we have to make sure that we have the money in place. Our, public our police 
are uh, understaffed and underfunded. They do have about 20 officers out on leave currently, and at nighttime we have less than 10 officers covering the entire city of Richmond. We have a public safety issue. And in order for us to hire more police to, uh, uh, to work at night, we have to be willing to get money revenue. So how does the city of Richmond make money? There's three, re there's three, re um, three ways that the city of Richmond makes money. Property taxes, utility use taxes, and business taxes. Hopefully with the construction of new housing in the city of Richmond, property tax will increase. But with the utility use tax, I can't, people are using cell phones. I can't force everybody to go out and buy a, a house phone. <laughs> so the last, the last leg that we stand on, in my opinion, is business. We have to make sure that we grow and expand businesses here in the city of Richmond. That's small businesses, cooperative businesses, and recruiting more, um, more manufacturing businesses to the city of Richmond. Making sure that we have industries in this city that can provide livable wage jobs. That's why under my economic empowerment platform, I call it the two E's, entrepreneurship and employment. We currently have a 25% local hire ordinance in the city of Richmond. It's been working extremely well, and I think we should increase it to 35%. So that way, anyone that wants to do business in our city has to hire at least 35% of our residents. And to get rid of the age-old excuse that we don't have the, res the workforce in the city of Richmond, I'm hoping to start the school-to-union pipeline at Richmond High School. And what that looks like is the students in Mr. Milam's woodshop class will be going into the apprenticeship program for Carpenters Local 152. And in November, we're going to be hosting a career fair where, I, where we've invited all of the building trades who have also been endorsed by to come to, the, to come to Richmond High School to not only help out our students, but to, to help out our families as well. Because in addition to our school to union pipeline, I think it's important that our helmets to hard hats pipeline is shored up so that way military veterans coming home from, from service don't have to compete for minimum wage. And individuals looking to improve their lot from re-entry also have an opportunity at good livable wage, worker protection, and, and, and good money. That's what we need here in the city of Richmond. We need to make sure that individuals have the purse to spend, and we need to make sure that we have businesses here in the city of Richmond that can contribute to our tax base. I serve on the Economic Development Commission as the chair, and so we've been working on these issues in the past. I also serve on the Citizens Police Review Commission. I'm a school community organizer at Richmond High School. In addition to that, I serve on the board of directors for the Richmond Museum Association, as well as the Salesian Boys and Girls Club. And as mentioned, if elected, I do plan to move Richmond forward without leaving anyone behind. And that's with my commitment to community engagement, economic empowerment, and public safety. This is why I've been endorsed by two former mayors, both Rosemary Corbin and Irma Anderson, six former city council members, current city council member J.O. Myrick, the California Democratic Club, the Democratic Party of Contra Costa County, the West County Democratic Party, Assemblyman Tony Thurman, as well as the former mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, and the East Bay Times recently endorsed my campaign, saying that he's young, but he's done his homework. And I hope that you guys can trust that and elect Demolish Johnson III on November 6th. And if you already have your ballot with you, um, Demolish Johnson III is third on the ballot. <laughs> And I hope that you mark that box, not only because, as I always tell individuals, this election is one of the most important elections in our lifetime. It is literally going to determine the next 20 to 30, if not 50 year trajectory of our city. And what we need are individuals in the driver's seat who's willing to make a commitment to the residents, to the business of the city, and to make sure that we move Richmond forward without leaving anyone behind. Once again, thank you, Marina Bay Community, for inviting us. Good evening, Marina Bay. How are you guys doing? My name is Diego Garcia. I'm a 40-year-old Richmond resident. Before I get started, I would just like to share a history of my family here in Richmond. My dad moved here in 1963 to work at Color Spot in North Richmond. He was also one of the first taqueros who actually uh, gave up tacos back in the early 70s in all community events. 
Uh, he would go to the uh, meat markets and pick out all the food that they would throw away that is very expensive nowadays at Safeway or any of your local market stores. So he was one of the first who invented, in this area, the taco sales. And now you see down 23rd, Rum Rio, San Paolo, a lot of the taco places. So my dad, after that, brought us here in the early 70s. My two younger brothers and sisters were born in the old Richmond Hospital on 23rd Street. Because of the low economics, the uh, faded school system, and no youth resources, that pushed me and my brothers and friends of mine to the streets. At age 19, I was a gang member, I was in jail, I got shot, and I was a young father. According to the statistics, I shouldn't be here speaking with you guys. But now, I'm a city council candidate. And I earned that, and I get thanks to community leaders who inspired me, like Marcos Gonzalez, who was a principal, Fred Jackson, who was a community activist and leader in Richmond, and other community leaders who inspired me and said, Diego, you have something else better for you. I'm not sure what they saw in me, but that sparked, lit it something that now I'm one of the community organizers for 23 years. Actually, the Richmond Marina was my backyard in the early 80s before this was built. <laughs> Me and my friends used to come out here because of no after school programs. We used to come here and play. We used to climb the trees, cut lemons, apples, pears. We used to fish. This was our home until a genius beautify this place and build these homes. Right after that, the community leaders who better shaped my life gave me a second chance. And at age 20, I started picking up kids from my neighborhood once called Easter Hill. And I used to take them to my house. I started with four kids and in less than three months grew to up to 30 kids that I was feeding with a budget of $30. Soon after, the Richmond Police Department hired me as a crime prevention specialist to work with the school district and them to be able to find better ways and routes on how to take the kids from school and home in a safe place. Then after that, I was hired by the uh, school district to um, direct the Healthy Start program and hire case managers, work closely with the uh, youth counselors there, and to be able to provide better service for the kids. Soon after that, I was a gang expert and work closely with the public defender's office to be able to help the young kids who were wrongfully incarcerated. I was a gang expert in two counties and have been working with them for the last 15 years. Soon after that, I was one of the commissioners for Parks and Recreation who came up with some ideas. With zero budget, we went up to $6,000 in our budget to be able to find ways on how to uh, maintain our parks and our fields. There was a budget to be able to build tennis courts in our parks. And I told them that is all good. We need more sports for our kids. However, you have to realize that what is the maintenance of that? We, we uh, told them about a dual sports facilities in our parks. Be able to have soccer and tennis at the same time. If we were to only build just tennis courts, in less than three months, they would have been destroyed. But because we built tennis courts and soccer, they're being used till now. And they're still up. And the own community maintained them. <coughs> Soon after that, I was also actually turned out nine years in the, citizen, I mean, in the uh, Parks and Migration Commission. I'm now currently serving the Citizens Police Review Commission for two years now. I also founded a soccer program. I started with 15 kids in less than two years, grew to 300 families. And we just don't do soccer. We're very involved with the community, and in order for them to participate in this soccer program, all parents and kids have to do 40 hours of community service, which times that, for the whole year, came up to 40,000 hours of community service. We renovate soccer fields, parks, and we are very committed to this community. I remember when Martinez, Conquer, and other cities would not be able to come out here because of the crime that we were facing. I was able to 
uh, commit with all these other cities to be able to come out here and really see the difference between our community for what they see and hear in the media. I also joined a political uh, movement nationwide, and we, I organized with other friends of mine a political march for the uh, immigrant rights and was able to organize over 8,000 people, the two largest community marches in Richmond. This was in 2006. Now, in order to be able to combat with one of the problems that we have in Richmond, it's not just one, it's many, depending on the community that you live in. Of course, Marina, Point Richmond, Central, the Iron Triangle has different needs, and we have to be able to understand those needs to be able to help them. I, would be, I believe that in my 23 years of working with this community and my expertise, I am one of those candidates that is able to bring the community forward to be able to be part of the process and make that change that we need to see here. And the way we do that is by rewiring kids' brains. I organize a program called the Family Council where I teach kids life skills and their parents to be able to do that for them. And now I travel statewide and over to Mexico and Peru to be able to work with the police, the mayors in those towns, and be able to see how we can find a sister city to be able to connect those services together. Uh, with all of that work that I have done, I've been recognized statewide with the Congress, city. I am the only community leader have, who have been given different awards and proclamations by our four different mayors in this city. November 6th, I'll ask for your endorsement and your vote. Thank you, guys. Dave, show them I'm here. Hey. Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Are you fired up and ready to go? Yeah. Uh, we got just a couple more. All that warm up back was pretty awesome. I'm Dave Schoenthal. I'm running for Richmond City Council. Uh, a little bit about me. So I grew up in a small town uh, down south called Redondo Beach. Uh, it reminds me very much of parts of Richmond. And I grew up as a beach boy. Uh, surfing, surfing the beach and enjoying that and I also became a professional surfer so when I say catch a wave with Dave, it means something. <laughs> um, also, uh, fell in love a couple of years ago, it's um, been about 22 years now, I'm a beautiful bride and um, we moved here to Richmond uh, 18 years ago and um, I at the time was a speech communication instructor, that's what I wanted to do, that was my vocation. But I quickly learned that I couldn't piece, enough, piece together enough jobs in order to uh, make a living. So I found a thing called sales. And uh, for, that, for most of my adult life, I was a sales and business development um, expert. That's what I did. And um, nine years ago, my daughter started school. She's now 13. Started school, and um, that's where it started my volunteer career. And so um, they told me, hey, go out and use your sales skills to raise money for, for the local school. And uh, so I became the president of the Point Richmond Business Association. I drew, I drew, a, I drew a short straw on that one. Uh, but six years of that, and then I, then I became, and I then started raising money for the picnic in the Point, um, which is on October 20th this year, by the way, is at uh, Washington Park. And it's a, fun, a, fam, a family fun event. But what it's done is it's raised over $100,000 for local nonprofits. And so what I find in all these years in sales, it's, it's great. It's making money. It's wonderful. It's taking care of the family. But what it's not doing is it's not feeding my soul. And so I, I came to the point of, of, of enjoying so much volunteering in the community that I'm here as a public servant. I'm, I'm striving to, to, to really be of service to you. And that's where I see the, the country, I see our city, I see our world, is that the thing that's the biggest problem that I'm seeing over and over again is that we're not heard. We're not feeling heard. And so when I, when I think about that, like how do we solve these problems that have been discussed tonight and that many of you have on your mind? And the way that and this is what was really weird. When I started, when I came to um, run for office, they said, oh, what you, what you should do is you should raise $100,000 and you should go find people that look like you and sound like you and vote for you. And that didn't sound interesting to me at all. Like, why would I want to X out 
all of the population and just find that sliver. Because the really true lasting solutions come from people who have disagreement. And so since March of this last year when I announced, I've been having collaborative solutions workshops. So things like illegal dumping, homelessness, housing, human trafficking on 23rd Street, which is some of the worst human trafficking anywhere in the country. But we had in that room over 100 people trying to figure out how we could work together, not just the community, but resources like the police and also the Family Justice Center so that we could decide, hey, can we do these things? Are they even feasible? Are they already being done? And we just had the 10th one on Monday night with uh, Mr. Devil Johnson III as the co-host. We worked on cannabis, the future of cannabis enrichment. So we were hearing things, we've heard things about, well, we need revenue, right? We need revenue to pay for the services that we have in Richmond. Well, here we're talking about not just growing marijuana, but we're talking about businesses that have clothing. We can have clothing businesses. We could make rope with it. We could do all kinds of businesses around it. And how do we go about doing that is the key question. So since it's not about me, it's about you, I'm curious to know, because how much more time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes. What's the top priority for you? Just a show, show of hands. What's the top priority for you? Is it safety? Is it crime? Is it Point Melati? It's Point Melati, right? So Point Melati, we were looking at that issue, and we're like going, it's the fix it in from the get-go, because you're at 670. If we started with the vision of a blank slate, and we got us all in the room, we can really vision that. But if it starts with the fundamental thing is, I don't know about which of these things to use, uh, how many houses, is, should there be housing? Then we're really at a crossroads. And so what we really need to do is get together again, respect each other, and that's what I bring to the table. It takes nothing for me to work with Demolis Johnson, or Diego Garcia, or Cesar DePeda, or any of you. It takes nothing away from me to work with you. Right? That doesn't, it doesn't lessen me to help someone else out and shine, too, as well. So the key things that we've worked on with these Collaborative Solutions workshops are public safety. So it's not just hiring more police officers, but we need a base, we need to hit our baseline. Right? Our baseline service of 112,000 people needs service. So we need to bring the police officers up to that service, service level, but connect them through community policing connect them in a real way so that we're safe together, not just police officers saying, hey, this is, we're, we're the police, but we're the community. The second thing is affordable housing and good jobs. And you've heard it discussed tonight, but what does that look like? Is that just affordable housing, or is it luxury? Is it low income? But how do we get there as a community and vision that together is the key. And then finally, not displacing anybody, keeping our neighborhoods intact. Maybe we, one of the things I heard was, hey, these, all of these houses that we want to build, maybe they could be great community benefits programs that could help people stay in place. Right? So there's visions out The wisdom is with you all. The wisdom's out there. I'm, my job is not to push ideology. My job is to remove the mountain that may be before us and help you get there. That's what it's all about. So when I talk about catching the wave with Dave, I mean, let's go, we're right on the top. We can cut into the tunnel, right into the tube, and right on through. Is that time? Fired up and ready to go. Two to go. Jane Ramirez. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having us this evening. My name is Virginia Ramirez, and I go by Vicky. I was born in Salinas, California, to Mexican parents who worked in the vegetation in the vegetation fields. They have taught me humility and hard work, and I love them very much. I have lived in Richmond for the past 20 years, and I have attended the public schools here. In 2008, I earned a Fulbright scholarship to UC Berkeley, and in 2012, my BA in social welfare. I chose this career because I truly care for the welfare of, the, of everybody. 
And unfortunately, after graduating, I was unable to find a job in the career that I wanted, and I started working at Target overnight. There, I ended up using the skills that I had learned. There was a coworker of mine that was being harassed by a supervisor, and I volunteered to translate for her so that we can go to HR. I also mobilized other workers to do the same. Eventually, that supervisor did not follow the feedback that HR had um, given him, and he was fired. Till this day, I still work at Target on the weekends. My <coughs> full-time job it consists of a legal immigration assistant at a, a nonprofit here in Richmond, where we provide legal immigration, low-cost legal immigration services to many Richmond residents. It was there at the front desk where we provide information and referral that I kept hearing the same story about high rent increases, no repairs, and fear of retaliation if they demanded these repairs. And so I referred them to a nonprofit down the street. But a lot of them kept coming back because they weren't able to receive help, they needed a social security number. So I didn't know what to do. And then a member of ACE, that's Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, came by and spoke to us about a city council meeting that was gonna happen where they were gonna discuss those specific issues. And I know I had to be there to attest to the injustices that I was seeing. I've been a member of ACE since then. As a member of ACE and volunteer, I helped pass rent control and just cause for evictions twice. And I also spoke out at the Board of Supervisors twice, one to oppose the jail expansion at the West County Facility Center, and the other one to support Contra Costa Cares, which is health care for the undocumented, because I prefer preventative health care over high-cost emergency rooms. The education that I received in college made it even more clear to me that in order to represent people, we have to look at all the factors that affect us for example, in order to survive, we know that we need water, food, and shelter. Housing is shelter. Yet there is this unreachable and unrealistic uh, race to be able to put a um, stable roof over our heads. And that's why I believe that housing is the number one issue in Richmond. The housing situation is just out of control, and we should not normalize it, and we should not accept it. We should stand up and say this is not okay. It is not okay to pin landlords against renters, and renters renters again, landlords, to mask the bigger issue that is we're both being squeezed. High rent increases on one side and more taxes for home, uh, homeowners. The solution that I propose is not enough, but I will start off with yes, we do need more affordable housing. Unfortunately, affordable housing takes time, even years, and our renters need relief right now. That is why I support Prop 10, that's the repeal of Costa Hawkins, uh, in order to enact uh, rent control for apartments built after 1995 and also single family homes. On the side of homeowners, I would delegate to the appropriate city departments to come up with ways to decrease those taxes. In conclusion, we all have to share this city and we need to come up with comprehensive solutions for landlords, homeowners, and renters. Because if we allow our differences to come in, in between us, we're not going to be able to um, to, make, to create stability in Richmond. If elected, my main three issues will be housing, defending immigration rights, and maintaining the welfare of the city, for example, the roads, the parks, and continue the beautification of the city with the arts. I am reliable, resilient, hardworking, honest, and anyone that knows me can attest to that. I ask for your support on November 6th. Thank you very much. Well, we come down to last but not least, certainly, and it's kind of interesting because if we had gone alphabetically, Nat Bates would have been number one. But we do a, a random number generator, and Nat is the last. Hello, everyone. We have the best for last. I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. You does a great job. We've been together for like we're almost there. It's so nice to see so many of you. Uh, gee, you're looking better than every day. Well, I hit the first question in terms of uh, what's the biggest problem in Richmond? Budget. Running a city of $116 million is no different than your household. It's a little bit more complex and a lot bigger, of course. 
but you've got to get the revenue to pay for your expenses. Simple as that. And you can't spend money that you don't have. And you can't borrow money to balance your budget. That's the number one problem that we have. Money, money, revenue, 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 whatever you want to call it. The second is the police department. We had uh, uh, 100, 212 officers at one time allocated. The majority of this council dropped that to 178. Of the 178, 20 positions are unfilled for various reasons. Nobody didn't want to be a cop anymore. Another 20 officers are out on disability or stress. <laughs> so we have about 138 officers, of which about 10 of those are probably management. And we're operating with about 120 officers on the street. Totally unacceptable. These guys are working so hard, and it's mandatory overtime. If, they, if someone is sick and uh, a person just got through doing an eight hour shift, you're mandatory. You got to work. Now, what does that do to a, a also over a period of time? They're stressed out and then wind up. They get an injured. How do we resolve the problem? Revenue, revenue, revenue. This city is not a friendly city to businesses. I can count many times whereby individuals have come to me and we've tried to work through the maze. And some of them I've been successful and some of them I have not been successful. Because this city hall is not friendly to the business community. And I'll tell you one thing, if you don't have good police protection, you're not going to attract anyone to come into this city. In fact, you're going to start losing people. But let's get back to another issue in terms of, I hear candidates saying what they're going to do. Let me tell you what I've done. And there's a difference between what you're going to do and what you've done. Some of you live in these beautiful homes. Some of you got these panoramic views of San Francisco. Let me tell you, every housing development in the city of Richmond, I voted for. Everyone from the Point, uh, uh, Point Richmond, the, uh, all the way to Hilltop, to the El Sobrano Valley, and of course here in Marina Bay. Every development I voted for. And now you live in a beautiful home. It didn't happen just by coincidence. We were accused of being in the pockets of the developers. But we saw a need for upscale housing to bring a lot of solid people into this community. And that's what we did. Marina Bay was a lot of problems. Well, first of all, uh, you, you're sitting on a, a, a mud flat. Uh, <laughs> Uh, high tide's going to wipe the property away. Well, we have the shipyards here in the vicinity. Well, there's chemicals out there. All kind of excuses came forward to prevent us from going forward and developing this marina bay. And thanks to Robert Poe and your good friend Richard Poe, some of you are a little bit upset with him now. <laughs> uh, Putin, Mike Giametti, and the Signature Homes and other developers, they came in and we voted for this development. And now you live in one of the pride places in the city of Richmond. Now, how soon we forget? There's so much that I could talk about in terms of my involvement. The Hilltop Shopping Center. The Costco. All of these are revenue generators. Uh, Pacific East Mall. These are businesses that have come into this city, not my doing, but with my assistance and my involvement. And you need to understand, and I think most of you do, no one person does anything in this city. As much as I've been involved in the Knox Freeway, going back to Washington, as much as I've been involved in the Moody, fortunately and unfortunately, we had that incident, tragic, and we were able to go to Sacramento and to Washington to bring in over $20 million to put in that underpass. 
None of these candidates were there, but I was there. I went back to Washington on your behalf and secured funding for the project. And now you don't have to worry about the trains and you stopping you and where you can't get to and from. Those are things that are very important. Lastly, as an elected official, I have learned again that you cannot do things by yourself. I worked with John Knox to get the freeway. I had a close relationship with Jimmy Carter. In fact, he's the one that provided the funds under his administration for the freeway. I worked with J.W. Bush. We call him Old Man Bush. I even worked with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Clinton. And of course, my favorite I worked with was Obama. And with Diane Feinstein, who's been a personal friend of mine for 40 years. George Miller, Senator Boxer, even Pete Wilson, who was a Republican. But we worked together. You cannot do things by yourself. If you don't have friends in Washington and Sacramento with Jerry Brown, now he's on his way out, but with Newsom, who's a good friend of mine, uh, you are not going to get the money that we send to Sacramento and to Washington. Even with uh, our president up there, as he is today, uh, we've got to have collaborative working relationships. And that is what my profile has been. The 40 years I've been your city council member, twice as your mayor, numerous times as your vice mayor, and the rest is your city council. Look at number 13. <laughs> well, and behold, we got through 15 candidates. How many openings are there on the, on the uh, council? There are three. You have 13 people you've heard. There are three openings. Got a decision. Uh, everybody did receive the order of speaking and also the questions. So they were prepared. They chose how they were going to address those questions. And people approached it in different ways. And that's part of what you should look at and think about and pass whatever judgments or values you want to do. Um, once again, we've done it. Once again, we cheated death when we got through this thing. Uh, really, really appreciate the turnout. And go out and vote. And thank you very, very much. Have fun.